Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Cool. Okay. Um, if any, is someone able to share the agenda as well so people can see it? Fantastic. Thanks, you, Lucina. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started. So if you have not added yourself to the list, please go ahead and do so now. And we'll start with some uh, agenda bashing. Uh, is there anything not on the agenda that uh, that you would like to have added on? Okay. Your silence says no. So uh, we have a couple of upcoming events. So next week on Tuesday is the Cloud Native Network Functions Seminar. I, I think some, there's something about Mary that is a good one. Too. Uh, Anyone interested? So there's someone has their uh, their mic on and there's some background voices. Cool. Anyways, so we have the open uh, the Cloud Native Network Functions Seminar. Uh, that's next Tuesday during the afternoon in Vancouver. If you are going to be there and you haven't registered, now's the time to do it. You can go on to the Open Source Summit's website and they have a way for you to add a registration. Even if you've, even if you've already gone through the process of registering, you can, you can update the registration. Uh, a, couple, a couple other things on that. Uh, oh, nice. So I'll let you do those as, uh, as announcements as well. Uh, we have ONS Europe coming up uh, as well, and we have a talk for Network Service Mesh. And so I will let uh, Taylor and Taylor and Watson, if you want to talk about what you're presenting real quick, since we're talking about events. I'll speak on their behalf. I've got my mute mute button on the ready. So we're going to do an overview of the CrossCloud CI and um, how we've implemented the ONAP project to the dashboard. And uh, yeah, it'll be just a quick 20 minutes on that. And I don't know that we're gonna talk too much about our, our progress on the CNFs. So it'll be mostly about the CrossCloud testing system and dashboard. Cool. Very, cool. Nice. Very nice. Okay. Ed, do you have do you have an idea on the happy hour? Um, yeah. So I've also been asked to present for twenty minutes on network service mesh at that seminar. So I will be getting some slides together. It turns out to be remarkably hard to um, condense things into twenty minutes. So that that's always interesting. Um, and the other thing that I'm kind of, of bouncing around um, is the idea of possibly doing an NSM happy hour at a nearby bar. Um, and I, I still need to go take a look and see if there are some conflicting receptions that may be happening Tuesday night or whatnot. But, you know, if not, we'll probably go ahead and get it up. Um, you know, I'll definitely mention it as part of the slide deck. We'll probably get it up on the landing page. We're going to talk about it here in a little bit, uh, et cetera because I think it would be good to get people together uh, just to visit and talk, especially since people seem very excited and have a lot of questions. And 20 minute talk at a seminar does not really mesh well with that. Okay, so yeah, it'll be good to uh, to work out. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the the conference is scheduled something for every night, but my understanding is that they've limited the end of the invites uh, based on various criteria. So, like, I think Thursday was the partner and speaker reception and and speaker reception. Uh, Tuesday, I think, was uh, a diversity dinner. Um, so, uh, so that might be the that's the only conference I'm aware of. But uh, yeah, I, there, 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 there may be others, so, so we definitely need to, to work out. And that's right, um, Wednesday is the aquarium. Okay. So, so special, on special announcements, uh, 
So what, what are the thoughts on canceling the, uh, the meeting? Um, I think so, I'm yeah, going to- I, I added this to the agenda. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think I'm going to be in an airplane at that particular, at this time on next Friday. Um, and I suspect a lot of other folks will be as well. Yeah, yeah so let's go and I, cancel it for- Yeah, perfect. Yep. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to see to have it canceled for next week. And uh, I, I don't think that we'll, I think what's going to end up happening is that uh, there will be people who are interested in network service mesh. I think if we hold a meeting on Friday, even if everyone was not on an airplane and would had the time to take it, I don't think we have enough time to prepare to help, to help onboard and get people on, to get people on. So, uh, so I think it would be good to have a little bit of, of time to, uh, to prepare. Yeah. So, Cool. So, um, f for the action items, we'll go over that a bit quick because we have a lot to we have a lot to go over. So, we have complete this project. We have completed. Um, let's see, a new linter for all YAML files. Uh, Mister, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I just I actually stumbled upon that. I wasn't even looking for that. Uh, I, I forget what I was doing that that led me down that path. But when I saw that, I thought, oh, that's pretty interesting. And and uh, you know, in my quest to automate all the things, I thought, you know, let's automate uh, this as well. And and it actually it actually found a bunch of stuff in our YAML files that I that I fixed up. So so I was happy with that. Nice. So. Uh, Okay, so that's that's been set up. So when you run your when you run the make file, then it uh, it just it kicks it off as well, right? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Um, okay, let fantastic. Me, let me hold on one sec. Let me just verify that. Oh, it, you know what? It isn't. But but in fact, as soon as this meeting is done, I'll push a PR that does that uh, because I. I added it directly to the Travis.yaml, but then I went and added it to a bunch of other Legato projects as well. And for those, I put it in the make file. So I will, I will, uh, I will push it so it's in our make file as well. So, so when you use the build, it, it does it automatically. Okay, fantastic. Um, then let's see. We also, so we also have our uh, document on using CNI with uh, Minikube. So if we can if we can add a link to the agenda, it, it, uh, Kyle, if you can add a link to the uh, to the agenda about that, that'll that'll be good. And uh, that leaves us to the last part, which is uh, building the NSM website using Hugo. And that, we actually have an agenda item for that, so we'll hold off for that one for the agenda. It might actually be next. Uh, it is next. So let's jump directly into the uh, into the OSS preparations. So we have a huge amount of work that's gone into the landing page. So if you haven't seen it yet, go to the network service mesh.io. It's, it's, uh, it's linked on the agenda. So you can click on that and, and take a look at it. And it, it would be really, really helpful. Like even if you don't want to add any content, if you just review it, make sure everything looks clear and uh, help us refine this so that when we, sh when we share it, that uh, it's, it's as clear as we can, as we can make it at this point. So. It is definitely yeah, a work is, in progress. It, yes. Mm -hmm. it, it definitely is. I was super happy with this because, because basically, you know, uh, basically getting this deployed to, to a global CDN basically took me a few hours, which is, uh, you know, 2018 is amazing in certain ways because, because that was awesome. And I love the fact that it's, that it's Hugo and we're CIing it and then it just automatically deploys to Netlify once we merge things back. So, so super cool. Uh, it, it, it deploys to Netlify so fast that between clicking the merge button and typing in the URL, it's already updated. It's. Yes. It's a, isn't it amazing how fast it is? Yeah. So is there anything on the site that we want to point uh, people here directly to for, for review or anything or anything like that? Like, is there anything that comes to mind? Um, so I, I think 
probably a, a, a good review on the concepts would be very helpful. And uh, you know, the more people who try the getting started, the better. Uh, the getting started is a little bit sparse right now. Right now, it just tells you how to deploy a network service mesh to your uh, existing Kubernetes cluster. We need to get through and sort of also you know, show you how to try out the test case. Um, but yeah, that, that's, um, that's that's kind of where we stand right now. You, by by the test case, do you mean um, uh, Sergey's uh, test data plane? Yeah, exactly. Um, so basically, the test data plane, a test network service endpoint, and then a, a pod to connect to it. Um, yeah, it's uh, I I started that, and there are there is some fuzziness. Uh, there's some uh, steps that are not absolutely clear. Um, so. I, I'd be willing to to try to see if I could write that um, just as I try to figure it out and actually do it because I, I want to write a, a more complex uh, data plane um, NSE and um, I, I thought by uh, starting with Sergey's and trying to make that work it would give me a start to writing another one. Yep, so that's a good plan. I, I, it may take me a little longer than then somebody yeah. else, so, um, I'll have to figure it out as I go, but sometimes that helps to lead to uh, clarifying what the steps are. Hey, Tom, this is John. I'll, I'll be willing to help you because I'm trying to do the same thing this night. So. Yeah, I, I've been reading your stuff, John, and your PI as well um, about, uh, you know, that we discussed last week, and um, that was certainly extremely helpful. Yeah, I'm making a little sample app just now so we can actually use it as a, a test case. So, so my my recommendation in this one, since we have multiple people who are going to be looking at this in parallel, but we want a single document, and we have a limited uh, limited time because Tuesday, Tuesday is, I think, is, is the goal. So if we were to start up a, a Google Doc, and what we can do is uh, is you know start with outlining what we what we have. And if somebody does some work on it and gets some progress, stick the commands in and inside of the Google Doc, and then the next person who hops on can read, can look at that, and then fill out the next parts or clarify. And that way, that we 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 don't we don't end up having a, a temporary silo for for Tuesday. Yeah, uh, I agree. I think Google Doc might be better than a PR, uh, and we'll do the PR after we. For, yeah. Uh, at this point. So just just for the interest of of time, because you, nor, normally I'd say, you know, work out however you want to to collaborate or so on. But I, I think in this in this scenario, you know, and then I'll and I'll jump in as well, and I'll I'll see how much I I can I can push it forward as well. That'd be really good. I think I think it'd be the best way of doing it. Cool. So I will I'll go and create a a Google Doc now uh, and. Let's go ahead and um, yeah, give a give. Remember to give a bunch of us edit privileges on this one. Yeah, so I'll, 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 I'll create uh, If you guys, if you guys could also give me edit privileges there, because I may poke at this problem as well. Um, so yeah, th this is um, this is something I would love to see if we can get pulled together something very clear and simple for Tuesday because that will be a lot of people's um, first exposure. And I think the existing quick start is very clear and simple as far as it goes. It just doesn't go very far, right? Um, it's the run this one command, congratulations, you are now network service mesh enabled in your cluster. Okay, and now what? <laughs> yeah, we need, to see some, uh, we need to see some applications and traffic going between the two oh. applications to make sense. Yeah, yeah and it, we'll, we'll have to do it in stages because right now we only have the test data plane really. And we'll we'll have to get to something a little more real with a you know a remote data plane before we can really start cooking with gas. Yeah, that's what I that's what I wanna I wanna work on is and uh, I, I I'm still a little confused about where some of the bits go uh, that you actually need to start getting traffic moving in the through yeah, the towards, through towards the, the end, um, you're, gonna be, you're gonna be building on um, if you're looking to be building on VPP. Um, there are now some Docker files in the VPP repo that I pushed recently. So that might give you a starting place. 
Right. I'll just I'll just start with Sergey's example because it's probably really really simple and people can actually look at the code and understand almost everything. If you try and throw in VPP, you've got to teach them VPP now. Yeah, and then, I mean whatever whatever we end up doing has to be simple as hell, right? Yeah, got it. Yeah. All right. So, uh, the so is there anything else there? So we have documentation listed as a uh, as an agenda item. Is it, did we just cover that, or is there something else that uh, that someone had in mind for for that bullet item? Uh, I think we may have just covered that. I mean, I think we're getting a pretty good set of stuff in the documentation. There's actually one thing I could use a, an opinion on. So when I put together the documentation page, um, right now it loads up concepts first. So if you just click on the docs link, you'll be taken to concepts. I do sometimes wonder if maybe uh, documentation shouldn't land you in setup. In other words, we shouldn't switch the order so that setup leads before concepts. Uh, I would very much welcome opinions on that. I bet you can argue it both ways. So, oh, I, I, you can definitely argue it both ways. Among other things, I, I, I'm very, very, very pleased with the quick start uh, image that we wound up with. That image makes me very happy. Except right, so for the setups. <laughs> okay, just a quick note: there is now a document, and uh, it is editable if you have this link. So be careful with sharing it out too far. But I think it's safe to put on this agenda for now. Cool. So we're saying, uh, so so which particular one? So you said it's under, so when you're in the start page, you said that you go to, to documentation and then you'd say. Uh, yeah, so click documentation right now on the top level menu. Right. Um, right now, it, it will drop you onto the concepts page because that's the first one on the list of the nav for documentation. And the question right. is, do we want to with setup instead of with concepts? That's, that's uh, a, good a link to setup or a link to the docs directory on this page probably would be uh, what we need. And I, I think starting with concepts and the narrative is good is a good thing, but we probably need a link that says, okay, now go do something if you want okay. and have Maybe. a link back to the docs page underneath these two or whatever. Yeah, listed as like, what, uh, uh, what's next? And then like, that way it drives them like a, like a narrative. Right. Okay. I think ideally we'd have to we're having some way of this is long term linking your long presentation back into steps in the documentation. Uh, you well, actually, uh, uh, could you go, Lucina? Could you go to uh, concepts and scroll down a little bit? So if you go, if you go to concepts, uh, the first one is the sort of what is network service mesh. But if you scroll down a tiny bit from that. You literally have the embedded slide deck. Yeah, but I was saying, you know, translate that into code, into code steps. Oh, that would be fabulous. Yes. We don't have the supporting code for it all yet, but yes. Yes, yes, exactly. But you know, it, well, yeah, that's, that's, um, I, I think that uh, some of the questions you asked um, in the, uh, in the narrative document, the Google Slides document along the side are a beginning to for people to think about what we need to flesh in. Yep. So, cool. Well, 
So on the, the uh, draft of working group proposal, I apologize, I've not made any progress on that this week. I've been very focused on trying to get the website together. No problem. I think um, I, I think the website, I think, is the highest priority. Tim, I think, will, will wait for us. So, so I think we're I think we're good on that. Um, also, I had one other thing. I, I was on mute. So, um, what in terms of the in terms of the uh, the OSS preparations? So, I have this little. Uh, web application that I've been working on that allows people to type in questions and what I so this is based on what I proposed earlier that we have something that we can type questions in and they just pop up on the website so it's designed to be stuck in a iframe and uh, it all happens live so as like as you edit the uh, as you edit this the page then uh, or as people add things where their questions or answers they automatically pop up and so uh, so what I what I'm hoping that we can do is is set it up so that if people have questions at any particular event, uh, we can have this thing running on the side somewhere and use it as a as a honeypot to catch questions, and then and we can answer them on you know either have someone answer them who's on in the crowd or have someone answer or have one of us answer it after after talks. And the and the and the end result is that we take those questions, and then it gives us a a process to work out like how do we want to incorporate this into our into our markdown. So it's not designed to be permanent; it's just for for running during events. So so I'm going to finish up the application today, and we'll and we'll we'll see about uh, finding a way to to integrate it nicely so that uh, so that it works. So. I don't have a link to it yet. I haven't pushed it up to GitHub yet, but I will. I will push it up soon. So, and one of the nice things about it is that when you do the answer, like it literally will just show up on everyone else's page. So there's no refreshing or anything like that. So it's so it's designed to be live and dynamic in that sense. So, anyways, uh, I barring any questions with that, uh, uh, let's move on to the draft. X Factor CNF. So I created a, oh, it doesn't look like I posted the, uh, the GIST on here, so I'll post it right now. So, but basically I created a, uh, a GIST that has information on what I'm thinking of for the X Factor, um, uh, for the X Factor CNFs. And I have the link here. I apologize for not having it up right now. There we go, and so I so I'm starting with uh, with this, and the idea is not to say this is this is what one of these things, like how do you do one of these. So the idea is to try to to set the agenda as to what I think uh, the community should should rally around, and specifically, uh, I so I so there's a diverse set of bullet points. You can see like the the toll factor apps are aiming more towards making it easy for developers to to build the applications, to maximize the portability of the, of the applications, uh, to be able to deploy on modern clouds, uh, minimize the divergence between development tests and products, and then to provide horizontal scaling. And I think that we can start with those properties as well, uh, you know, and, and, and learn from them. And they're very high level. I put some stuff that were a little bit more that were a little bit more specific on the CNF. So things like no VNF should have specific kernel modules. Um, and, so, and, and so if you're right, if you're rewriting a VNF, I'll, re I'll rename that to CNF. So if, as you're moving from VNF to CNFs, many VNFs have specific kernel modules. And if you have to deploy a kernel module, you're breaking out of the isolation. So that's, so that just, just as an example. Uh, and so to try to, to work out like how do we how do we move people from VNF style thinking to, to to CNF style thinking? Another challenge we're running into right now, and I think the Volk people are are definitely on this, is uh, like even defining what a CNF means. Like like what is a what is a CNF? And trying to trying to define and say this is the, this is a CNF. This isn't a CNF. Uh, I think is 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 
going going to continue to evolve for a while. So like even being here saying, here's how you write CNS is dependent on, on that question. So can I ask a question? I mean Sure. I think one of the things I think I think we just mean me for my worldview is that a CNF is not an endpoint. A CNF, you know has traffic going through it, not it's not destined for. Does that make sense to everybody or is that just, just my parochial view of it? No, I think you're actually, so I, I think you're right in the, in the global sense. Um, it, it, but it, from, it, it, there, there is a perspective, there are perspectives from which they are endpoints because from the perspective of, so from the perspective of some consumer that wants to connect to a CNF, that network service is an endpoint, right? All it knows is it shows packets back and forth. From the global perspective, you're absolutely right. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, I, I, from my perspective, and tell me if I'm wrong, I think when we talk about an NS network service endpoint, we're talking about a control plane endpoint. That's saying that the final thing we want configured happens there. But uh, but it could be an endpoint that, for, exist for example, is a is a firewall or a, a router, so therefore tra packets will still throw, flow through it. Is, is, isn't, that, um, isn't that correct? From, so in other words, it would be a control plane endpoint, but not, a data, not necessarily a data plane endpoint. Yeah, and I, I have a tendency to, to also think, like when I, when I was writing this, one of the things that occurred to me was that uh, we want to be very distinct as well, but there's, there's also a relationship to uh service i guess you say um, service function chaining on on in cloud native environments and so, so so i think part of part of how i'm going to try to approach this is about not just about how do you scale the cnf but how do you scale the service function chain itself and but so you're, and, so you're a service function chain you are, you're talking about cnf that do not terminate you're talking about things that must pass through because you know CNF one must pass through to CNF two through the service function chain. Yeah, and as and they and they can grow independently. Like maybe yeah. one is very computationally expensive, and it has to grow with computation. Maybe number two is very data or very throughput intensive, and it has to grow parallel to to land you more NICs and landing landing one of these on a system that already has where you already have one on it uh is not going to is, is actually going to doesn't work yes the so um well but so, but um fred isn't isn't a chain uh, a node on a service function chain could still be a uh, traffic will go through it but from the from the standpoint of the nsm it could still be an endpoint because we're configuring that if that name if that node has some kind of configuration uh you know, I, I i i don't know clarify that please from your standpoint so so i want to make sure that i understand the question um so so the, is the question about like uh, about um I'll try. I'll try answering and tell me if, if if I hit if I hit your your question. So in terms of in terms of endpoints, uh, like yes, there's there's endpoints and yes, we have the data flow through them. Uh, but I but I would also argue that every CNF itself is also is also an endpoint. So like if you look at at least from the at least from the point of perspective from from the uh, from NSM, maybe other SF uh, service function chaining and control planes don't view it in this particular way. You know, but if you go through the how our CRD was developed, you know, we have a source and a and a destination that's defined for each for each node. And so, when you have a firewall, you, the chain the chain is is this this is like in the VPN uh, gateway case. You have corporate internet uh, connectivity and inside of that inside of that uh, service when you when you, the first connection is if you're not part of the service you go to the firewall and then the second one is if you are part of the service and you are the firewall then you're connected to the gateway so the gateway becomes the endpoint for the firewall and this change it just 
so 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 in essence it, it's the same pattern over and over and over again and and there's they all act each uh each section in the next change acts as the endpoint for the for the previous one so they're not they're not terminating endpoints as 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 the thing fred so right like a firewall on a router do not terminate connections right that's true well, so, so, the, so, firewall, that's, that's so firewall, these are not terminating the network traffic itself. Yes. They are terminating the L2, L3 connection. I think that's for this. Not always. Say. Yeah. No. Uh, no. Well, not, they, so. they, no, but they, they are, right? Because if I show an IP packet across the network service mesh container, uh, network service mesh L2, L3 connection, and it arrives at the firewall, um, you know, the connection definitely terminates the firewall. The traffic gets carried transparently yes, through. Yes, right? yes, um, And so that's, I think, a little distinction. One of the things that I think we probably want to uh, also focus on, and I find this very useful when I think about cloud native, uh, about CNFs, one of the things that's in the cloud native definition is something about immutable infrastructure. And, and I think this concept of immutable infrastructure, uh, together with the notion of what is on what side of the infrastructure, is a hugely powerful way to think about them. So for example, for cloud native, the kernel is part of the infrastructure, and therefore the kernel is immutable, right? Um, and so that's why your CNF can't have a kernel module. But there, there may be other kinds of things as we explore here that that, that fall out naturally from this uh, in terms of you know immutable infrastructure and where the line of demarc is between the application and infrastructure for CNFs. Yeah, and. That's a really great point, and I think configuring the kernel through the device plugin uh, API that in a controlled manner is acceptable. But saying we're going to we're going to shove a kernel module in that's going to affect other other CNFs, it, like you could still you can there's still use cases like these are set of heuristics. If you absolutely need to do it, no one's going to stop you from doing it, but you lose you lose something for it. Yeah, but the something you lose is the whole advantage of of uh, containerized uh, uh, functions. <laughs> oh, I definitely, definitely agree. And so that's yeah, and and so that, that's what I was saying. There was like a it's, it's like a set of, of guidelines and, and heuristics. But I think that yeah, I, I think that's a that's a really great way, way to look at it as well is to try to define the the borders and see uh, one of the things that I was that I that I realized is the orders of magnitude is more complexity that's here compared to the web application version. So when the 12 factors app came out and Adam was building it out. I mean, he had seen probably 10,000 or 100,000 different deployments and it probably worked with with customers to help resolve scalability issues with them and and how to configure and manage them. And one of the things that I think we're going to run into here is that the diversity of the types of deployments that we're going to see is going to be uh, is going to be significantly high, significantly higher. But I think that there's certain patterns that we'll be able to 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 see that will work across the board for, for all of them. And then if we want to drill down for a specific one because we see that it's problematic in that area, then we absolutely should. Uh, but yeah, so so this is so this is basically what I what I started with. Uh, I I should actually stick this in a Google Doc instead, so that people can can modify it. So I'll I'll do that as well. Uh, but any help with just like concerns, comments, you know, anything that comes to mind, you know, great greatly greatly appreciate it. And and I, I see this as not being like. Like Tuesday is not like the the endpoint for this. Like I'd, I'd love to be able to shop it around on Tuesday and get more people involved, uh, but I think this is actually something that is going to be like ongoing. So as we continue to work with network service mesh, and we people are going to ask us for guidance, we can give them as we can give them these these X factor uh, CNFs uh, guidelines as as guidance to help to help them work out how they should build build out and help them understand like why taking just a VNF and sticking it into a container is does not does not give them the ben the benefits of, of Kubernetes and that, that's that's really the point that I want to try to drive with uh, uh, to tr try to drive with people is that they need to start looking at their their cloud native infrastructure as as having specific properties that if they follow certain patterns they will gain the benefits of cloud native. 
And so, which means don't, don't rely on scaling up. Don't rely on kernel modules. Do rely on, on scaling horizontal. Uh, do, do rely on being very explicit and declarative in your configurations and defining your capabilities of how you can communicate, how you, what payloads you accept. And, you know, and, to, and, and also from the operational perspective, like it's very, one of the things that they have in the 12 factor apps uh, that uh, is a discussions I've had with, with, uh, with others was about, uh, it's like, where, where do you keep logging? You know, should you keep it centralized or should you keep it in some form of, in some form of, of event logging system, or should you have a single system that, that, uh, that is omniscient as an example. And one of the things that, that, that comes up with this is if you look at the 12 factor apps, uh, one of the things that they that they discuss is about you treat your logs as event streams, and so whenever you have a log, you you inject it into an event stream. That you have something like FluentD or uh, or Flume or something similar that's capable of capturing those uh, those logs and aggregating them together, and then you have another tool that can be used to to gain insight on your entire distributed system, your entire cluster. And so, like these are these are patterns that if you're working primarily with a single omniscient system, then you won't be familiar with these type of patterns. But if you worked on distributed systems, they're extremely common. And so there's also an opportunity to help as we move towards more a more distributed path to help bring some of these well-known concepts from other from from other areas. So, um, anyways, I will go ahead and create a uh, a document on that. And any any help I can get is is greatly greatly appreciated. Cool. Um, let's see, moving, moving down. Uh, I don't believe that the problems with Mellanox Nix have been resolved yet. Um, Taylor, were, were, were you able to have a, a conversation with, uh, Jacob by any chance? Yeah, I've, I've been carrying on a conversation with Jacob and some other folks about it. Um, right now they don't have any Nx5 NICs that are available for other folks. They do have some systems uh, with Intel NICs, so that's an option. Working on getting um, access to more of those and building out the specs that would be useful for the various projects, CNF, CNF comparison and NSM. And, and then there's been a lot of discussions to add is aware of on the CNX4 support with VPP. I think a lot of that's coming forward. So if we have that, then I think we'll be able to do more testing. Um, you know, probably I, I, can I end think, up with a lot of docs, how to. So I, I think CNX4, from, from what Michael was saying, if I understood correctly, CNX4 should work with VPP 18, with VPP 1804. There is some thing odd about the DPDK drivers the more recent DPDK drivers for Mellanox Nix in general that's currently being discussed and sorted out. So, um, but I do believe CNX4 should work with VPP, but not with the latest 1807 because it's using the latest DPDK and the latest DPDK drivers appear to be broken. Um, but it does work with 1804. So, um, yeah, so I mean, and, and we, we are we are just exiting the finger pointing stage of figuring out what the hell is going on with the drivers in, in you know, DPDK 1805. So I, th I think based on the output of all this, um, research testing and working, we can have, here's the specs that you need, here's the packet systems that um, are usable and any gotchas on the software install? Do check with Michael. He's the one who I think claimed to have gotten um, the CNX fours working in packet using VPP eighteen oh four. So he would know specifically. I'm just passing rumors at this yep. stage. Yeah, he, he he's. Uh, we talked a lot of this week about it. Um, so once some of the cleanup on the comparison code is there, then we're going to update some of the docs. That's on the CNF uh, CNCS CNFs project. We're gonna, all that's available 
what can roll something in with maybe a shorter dock for the NSM project as well. Cool. So, okay, nice. Is there is there anything that we can that we can do to to uh, to help Taylor as as well? I think right now most of it's waiting on um, Mike to finish his testing, and then if we hear anything back from uh, Melanox. Um, on any specific items or working out where the the problem is on the BPP code where we're having to go specific versions. So that's kind of outside of our hands right now. Right now, I think we're good. No help needed. Okay, cool. So if anything comes up, um, you know, you don't have to wait for the, for the meeting or anything, like come, come get a hold of us. So, and uh, thank you for Absolutely. taking the lead on this. Welcome. Okay, and um, I promised that a little bit of time so you can talk about Hannah and the hardware nix since we didn't get to it last week. So, the floor is yours for the rest of the for the rest of the meeting. Okay, one second. Let me go ahead and, and pull this up, and we'll go through it really quickly. Um, one second. Hang on. I had not anticipated presenting this, otherwise I would have had it all up and going. I apologize, I should have given you a little warning. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay, it's all good. Um, yeah, so one of the things, let me go ahead and start sharing. That is not the version of Chrome I wanted to share. One second. And just a little note um, uh, that if you look at the um, at um, at the narratives, uh, you see that there's a little bit of a, of a I guess you call a mnemonic uh, with it. So you have like. Um, Sarah in a secure internet, and you have Hannah and the hardware nicks and so on. So it makes it a little bit easier to, to, to remember. So when someone's talking about Sarah, you know what use case it is. Someone's talking about Hannah, you know what use case it is. Exactly. So um, basically, um, effectively, what I ended up doing here is I, I've got the single deck, and I've got a table of contents at the beginning that has links. You can click the link and be taken to the correct um, thing. So, you know, Hannah and the Hardware Nicks, um, you know, we have our character, Hannah. Uh, she's writing a Kubernetes app to be deployed on her on-prem Kubernetes cluster, and one of the pods needs some hardware Nick. Now, to sort of set the stage, uh, people tend to think about hardware Nicks the same way they think about GPUs, and they're so not, right? Uh, so some of the nodes in Hannah's cluster have special hardware Nicks, and some don't. Um, it's also the case that not all the special hardware Nicks are the same. Right? So not all of them connect to the same network, for example. Right? They connect to a bunch of different networks. Um, not all the special hardware NICs that connect to the same network have the same speed. So for example, some are 10 gigs, some are 100 gig, there might be some 40 gigs, whatever. Um, so you think, okay, great. So we, we've got what? Hardwareness, networkness, speedness. And then of course, you also realize that not all the hardware NICs are treated the same by the network they connect to either. Right, so some NICs connected to one, the network may have ACLs applied to them. Some may have cost guarantees. Um, and, and so you, you sort of start putting together this long list of attributes. You sort of discover that you can't just go enumerate all the attributes because network engineers are creative and we have created way more attributes than you think we have. Um, and so from Hannah's point of view though, her, her 
situation is very simple, right? From her point of view, she has a pod that has to be scheduled um, to some place that has a hardware NIC. Um, and then she needs a NIC injected into that pod. So, you know, again, Sarah's definition of hell, having to figure out which one, where, you know, how do I find out all the NICs in the cluster? How do I find out which hardware NICs provide the service I need? Uh, how does the scheduling get handled? Um, you know, how do we dot, we avoid collisions in terms of the scheduling? And of course, then we, we have Ariande, uh, our for, you know, friendly neighborhood spider, um, who comes and sort of introduces herself, uh, talks a little bit about network service mesh and how it's sort of like service mesh only for L2 and L3. And then, he asked, then she asks Hannah to um, explain her problems, right? So Hannah's like, okay, it's really simple. I want to deploy my pod where I can get the hardware interface that, that, that I need injected. It's a very simple problem, but she doesn't want to have to think about which one. She doesn't want to have to think about what node it's on. She doesn't want to have to wind up with a hardware NIC that doesn't do what she needs. Um, and she still wants to get her normal Kubernetes networking into her pod, right? So, you know, obviously the first question that everyone should be asking is what about the device plugin API? And, you know, it doesn't really quite get there because, you know, as Hannah points out, uh, you know, the device plugin doesn't get the information it needs to handle the networkiness of NICs. The CNI plugin doesn't get the information it needs to handle the hardwareness of NICs. And so you get this disconnect. Uh, plus, uh, Hannah doesn't need any old hardware NIC. She needs a hardware NIC that does the things she needs, right? So just saying, give me a hardware NIC or give me a 40 gig hardware NIC or give me a hardware NIC plugged into VLAN 10. None of those actually <clears throat> describe what it is that Hannah needs because what Hannah really needs is connectivity to a network service. And, and here's our friend, Sad Panda. So we start talking about how network service mesh could help, right? So network service mesh thinks about things in terms of, and this is the familiar intro to network services, um, network service endpoints, and uh, connections. But here's the thing. Um, when you actually look at this in Sarah's situation, what you really have is the node with Hannah's pod and you have the hardware NIC. And the hardware NIC is really the L2 and L3 connection. And in, in Sarah's situation, the network service endpoint is really the port on the top of rack switch, right? And that's really what we're connecting Sarah to via the mechanism of a hardware NIC. Um, make sense so far? Cool. Um, and then we dive into the how do I use this? And this is the very familiar, I'm going to skin through because we're all very familiar with this stuff. You know, talking about defining a network service, in this case, enhanced corporate connectivity. Um, and that sort of represents the class of hardware NIC that Hannah needs. And then in the pod spec, you simply put a resource request for enhanced corporate connectivity into your pod spec. And then of course, there's the obvious question about the networkiness here. And this is where the network service manager comes in. So Hannah's pod gets you know, dropped in with its NSM init container. It requests a connection. The NSM injects the hardware NIC and sends the accept. And it, so from Hannah's pod's point of view, it just looks like the interface appears. And it works very much like we're used to things working for a network service mesh. And of course, for the scheduling and everything else, it all works like normal device plugin mechanisms, um, exactly, you know, with no need for alteration. And you get connected to a NIC that actually provides the network service that you need because you're actually asking for the resource that is a NIC that provides that network service instead of just generically asking for, I would like a 40 gig NIC. So again, no Kubernetes upgrades, no CNI. And that's, I think, the last slide. So there, there's definitely some repetition between the use cases, but you know I wanted them to be self-contained stories. Uh, do folks have comments or observations? Suggestions are most welcome. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I actually did go through this the other day, and mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting hearing you talk through it as well. I think it's real helpful because the, the, uh, a NIC, a 40 gig gig, 100 gig NIC is, is concrete what I, I you know i think this is real helpful thanks a lot ed i'm glad you like it i mean in particular the one slide i was kind of really happy with how it came out was this slide 
because um, a lot of people, you know, it sort of really puts the fine point on it that what you really care about is what service is being provided to you um, by the network you're plugging into. Because all too many people, like I, I've literally seen lots of cases where people are thinking in terms of, well, okay, I need a hardware NIC. Okay, but what kind of hardware NIC? Oh, I need a 40 gig hardware NIC. Well, what is it connected to? Oh, it's connected to a network. Okay, well, what services are you getting from that network? And people tend to not think about the fullness of the problem space. And, and then as they discover it, the band-aids build up and it gets to be kind of ugly. So uh, we, would, we would define the fullness of the hardware requirements just by adding additional lines to the, to the spec in the YAML file, right? And then they would be cr criteria that would be matched by NSM in order to know which service to we're, we're not quite that complicated yet. Literally all we're doing is saying, we're defining enhanced corporate connectivity and for whatever that happens to mean. And then you know, in, in the particular pods, uh, some NICs will be marked as providing enhanced corporate connectivity, whatever that means. So Hannah doesn't actually really want to know, generally speaking, all the minutia of what enhanced corporate connectivity means, uh, because that can get to be quite stark. She just wants to know this is the thing, this is the kind of thing I connect to, and it gets the services that I need. Those services are defined by the details in the spec associated with that service type. No, no, the, 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 it's simply named. Just like network services in general and network service mesh yeah. are, are simply named services that provide stuff. Um, it's just sort of like, think of it this way. If I have a Kubernetes service, right? I, I, I don't specify in the Kubernetes service all the things about the, the service that it actually is. I basically tell you some very basic things about it and I give it a name. And, and similarly for um, network service mesh, you know, I don't have to enumerate, you know, I don't have to tell you in the network service definition that you're talking to a stateful firewall. I just give it a name. It does the things it's supposed to do. Yeah, I, I think I understand that. So if you want a stateful firewall, you ask for a stateful firewall. And you by name, you have a by name. name. Yeah. By name. Yep, yep. And so if, if I, I want to be connectivity, that's what I ask for. And that could involve a whole cluster of characteristics and services. Um, some of which you don't even have a good way to reason about. Will we ever have to have a network service mesh service browser? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, that's... You, you know it's coming. <laughs> yeah, there's going to have to be some kind of or ultimately orchestration driver that knows how Oh, they can have these enormous flat space of all these uh, services with slightly different names and uh, and to, to help know which ones to deploy. Um, no, and then I agree. Someone's going to have to map the abstract name to the to the details of what makes that abstract name unique for people like Hannah who don't really want to know, uh, you know, we're all in a, we're all in a world where everybody has their own domain of knowledge and they don't want to know about the other person's because if we, if we all knew about everything about everything, none of us would get anything done. So this will abstract yep. details. Yep. So yep. a little, uh, a little thing on that particular section. Um, so we're, since we're dealing with keys, uh, with, with basically key value as for, uh, for looking up the name, th there's, there, there's nothing that stops people from adding some organization through the key structure like they do in a CD. So you can stick a slash somewhere and then say, this is my corporate stuff and this is my VPN stuff or, or so on. And, and maybe build out a little bit of, of structure as well. So I think we'll see some patterns like naturally evolve that uh, yeah. that help with this, and they require no, ideally no code changes to, to what we're doing to to help support these. Um, other than maybe, yeah. maybe enumerate. But Kubernetes and etcd have some techniques for enumerating based on that forward slash, so we may even be able to make use of that. So we'll have, we'll to, have look, to look at that. I, I do apologize. I have a hard stop at the top of the hour, so I do have to drop off now. Yep. Me as well. Cool. So thanks, everyone. Look forward to seeing a bunch of you next week in Vancouver. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. All right. Safe travels. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Cheers. See you in Vancouver.